Um, I'm Big Law from HKESD, the Department of Physics, and uh, I'm also representing uh, the Hong Kong Young Academy of Sciences to give this talk. Uh, the topic today is on the emergent uh, uh, quantum technologies. So uh, I will I will talk about this uh, with my my co-speaker today, uh, Professor Johnny Ho. So Johnny will talk about other applications of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, other important uh, applications. So, um, so I should probably go to my PowerPoint. Okay. So this is the second lecture on the uh, on the on the a, a series. Uh, this is the second lecture for a series of talks on emerging technologies. Uh, 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 of our time, uh, so we the first the first talk was on gene editing. Maybe some of you know and, and attended uh, that talk. And this is the second one on quantum uh, technologies. And we will have uh, more coming, which uh, uh, for example on AI and robotics, on uh, science of climate change, on the uh, computer uh, assisted uh, drug design and, and topics uh, and cosmology. So topics like that. So the, this is the, the second talk. So and today um, I would uh, like to talk about so quantum computation, and Johnny will talk about other other uh, applications of um, quantum mechanics. So what's quantum computation? And uh, well, first of all, we need a quantum computer, and this is an uh, artistic uh, design of a quantum computer that. People can emerge, but uh, fortunately, uh, we are far beyond the stage of just emerging. Actually, people are building quantum computers, and this is a, a, a quantum computing chip uh, built by Google. It's called Google's uh, X1 um, quantum computing chip, and uh, here you see crosses. Each cross represents a bit. A quantum bit, so which I will tell you more about this uh, uh, quantum bit uh, uh, fabricated by Google. Each cross is made by a superconductor, so and you can use that to do some computation. And also other companies like IBM and Intel, they are also working on uh, quantum computer. So it has been uh, a very uh, hot topic. Uh, lately. That's why we want to introduce this to our, to our teachers and to our young people. So, and prepare our young people for the opportunities and challenges to come. And this is uh, one of the main purposes of our, our lecture series, which is to prepare our young people for the upcoming new technologies. So, this is our line of the talk. So, I will, you know, before you know about quantum computation, you probably need to know something about quantum mechanics. And uh, where is it from? Why is it important? And uh, what are the uh, main principles of quantum mechanics? Why is it so special? And uh, so first of all, we'll talk about, uh, well, before we have quantum mechanics, how we look at this world. And then I talk about this, some strange properties of the quantum world. So there are some very strange things about it. And uh, how, <clears throat> in the past almost 100 years, after the formulation of quantum mechanics, how it has changed our world. And maybe it will change furthermore in the coming decades. And then uh, I will talk about uh, the power of quantum computation. And then report to you the current progress quantum computation, and uh, also mention something about that, what I'm doing, which is related to Microsoft's scheme of building so the so-called Roger quantum computer. So, and before we have quantum mechanics, we have Newton. So the world was described by Newtonian mechanics uh, before we know quantum mechanics. So, and uh, for example, the motions of the objects are governed by Newton's laws, such as F equals to MA that all of you are familiar with. So 
So this really described this, the, the circular motion of the Earth around the Sun, the spinning motion of the Earth, and the projectile motion of the tennis ball and things like that. So it works very well, even for today. And then, uh, about 200 years later, so we have Maxwell, who really did a very important work. So he formulated the theory of electromagnetism. So he described the electromagnetic uh, phenomena by four equations. These equations tells us, tells us that, oh, for example, we can explain how light can propagate from the sun to the earth. So, and that's the topic of optics. And they can also explain how magnetic field can be generated, generated by moving charges, such as when you have a solenoid, you pass through a current, and that solenoid will create a magnetic field. So I think you also learned this, and that, that tells you how to make an electromagnet. And then you have, also tell, the Maxwell equation also tells you how, magnet, how changing magnetic field can generate electric field. So if you, if you can generate a changing magnetic field, you can actually generate electricity. So that gave you the guiding principles of uh, building generators and generating electricity. So this happened in the middle of the 19th century. So, and uh, starting from the, um, the uh, 1970s, actually people know how to use electricity. So that really transformed, that is the beginning of the so-called Second Industrial Revolution. So after, so the, the Second Industrial Revolution started from about 1870s and then until uh, 19, uh, 1914. That's the time that the First World War broke out. So, and uh, that was a really golden period of time that people, they know how to use electricity. They, they know how to use, instead of coal, they use petroleum. Instead of iron, people started making steel. So there was a lot of technological advancements uh, during that period of time. And people's life looks uh, really not bad. You know, they even have television in the 90s, 1920s, after the second industrial revolution. They have refrigerators. You have a lot of cars, even fancy cars like Mercedes. And uh, you have you know, plenty of lights in your house. You have telephone. Boeing was, uh, Boeing started making airplane in, in the, in the uh, start uh, from the 1910. And you have IBM. This is, a, this is a poster, advertisement of international business machine. That's IBM. So these companies, you know, the, these big companies, for example, the company making uh, telephones, it's AT&T, all these big companies, they were actually technological giants at that time, of their time. So, and uh, they still are until today. So that really tells you how important technologies are. If you have technology, you can really uh, do a lot of uh, things. And uh, so life looks, looks good uh, in the 1920s. As I, I mentioned, you have, you have real good cars. You have AT&T making um, telephones. You have General Electric, like companies like that generating electricity, you have airplanes, and you have IBM uh, making all, all sorts of machines. Um, but against this background, you know, life seems quite good, just like today. You know, we are probably quite happy with the life that we have. But at that time, there was a group of people, they are called physicists. They were studying some problems which are quite seemingly irrelevant to the life of people. And 
they were asking questions like that. Why atoms are stable? Right? That's the similarity has nothing to do with, with your daily life. People, they were asking, why atoms are stable, you know? I have an electron surrounding a proton. But from Maxwell's theory, it tells you that this electron, because it's, uh, it's, when, when it's circulating around a proton, it is actually accelerating toward the center. You know that a accelerating charge from Maxwell's theory tells you that it will, it will radiate. So it will lose energy. That means that Maxwell's theory tells you this atom will, rate, will, will lose energy and gradually collapse into this proton and just comply with this proton. And uh, but that didn't happen. Why? Why atoms like that are stable at all? So physicists are, are, are asking questions like this. And they also ask, oh, when I look at the spectrum of the sun, for different frequency of, of this electromagnetic wave, you actually see different intensity, like that. So this is intensity, this y-axis. The x-axis is wavelength. If you look at the sun, and you look at the wavelength, oh, this peak, this roughly is the temperature of the sun. And uh, this is a several hundred nanometers. So you, you do you know where this peak is? It corresponds to light of visible light, right? So that's why actually, you know, the sun has a has this uh, uh, when when it emits light, but different light it emits it has different intensity. So our eyes are adjusted to the to the intensity where the the sun emits the strongest uh, uh, the light with the highest intensity. So. But actually, when you observe this, you realize that, well, classically, it will give you this curve instead of this one. So again, it, Maxwell's theory cannot explain this observation. So physicists, they really try to understand some seemingly not very important things, but, well, they try to understand it. And uh, to explain this kind of phenomena, you want, you need a microscopic theory. You need a theory to, to describe microscopic objects, such as electrons. And that theory is quantum mechanics. So it took people almost three decades to fully understand, to formulate uh, quantum mechanics. And this is a very counterintuitive theory. And this, this is a very famous picture and, uh, and the people here, I'm sure you know many of them. Like Einstein, sitting in the middle, of course. And behind him was Schrodinger. And then you have Heisenberg, you have Planck. These are the fathers. And many, many others, like Dirac, uh, Neil Bohr, De Bocle, there are many, many. Pauli, these are fathers of quantum mechanics. So because of the effort of these people, they spent almost uh, three decades to understand, to try to find a theory which can describe objects, microscopic objects, like electrons, and answer the questions such as why atoms are stable. And so a simple equation to describe quantum mechanics is this, it's called the Schrodinger equation. But uh, instead of going into the details, the mathematical details, I just want to tell you two very important principles of quantum mechanics, which is also useful for uh, quantum computation. And one is so-called the superposition principle. So uh, suppose you have an electron with spin. We can view an electron with spin just like uh, you can think of actually every electron, it doesn't, it does not just carry charges. It actually carries spin. What does it mean? It actually, each electron carries a little bit of magnetization. You can think of an electron, besides carrying, carrying charges, is actually a very tiny magnet as well. And this magnet, um, you can have 
the north pole up, uh, south pole down, or south pole up, north pole down. So you can think, okay, your electron has this uh, spin. And it's, it's like a, a tiny magnet. And uh, what is uh, interesting about the superposition principle in the quantum world is that, well, we know that if you have a classical object and it is spin like that, well, and it is spin like that, right? So that's what Newtonian mechanics tells you. It's just, if it's spinning like this, it is in a definite state of its spinning like this, okay? But electron is different. In the quantum world, an electron can, can be spinning up, denoted by this symbol, this arrow up, and also it can be spinning down at the same time. It's a very weird thing. So it can, it can be spin up and spin down at the same time. Quantum mechanics tells you an electron can be in this room, and the room next to us at the same time, it can be at two places at the same time. It can, it can be in two states at the same time. And that's the strange thing about quantum mechanics. And this is called superposition principle. And another very strange thing about quantum mechanics is called entanglement. Quantum entanglement. So, What's the quantum entanglement? You have two electrons. Once they are entangled, you can separate them very, very far away. Okay, very, very far away. So once you do a measurement on one atom, even though the other one is very, very, very far away, 10 light years away, for example, you immediately change the property of that, of the, of the second particle. This is a very strange thing. You can emerge it. I'm operating on, on the electrons that I have here on my hand, but the other electron is 10 light years away, or, okay, maybe closer, it's on the moon, okay. So when I do something on the electron, the electron that I have, immediately you affect the properties of the electron on the moon. This is also a very strange uh, property of quantum mechanics, and that's called quantum entanglement. So, does it mean that the signal is faster than the It's not, it is not, it is not. It cannot, it cannot be used to, tra to transform, uh, to, uh, to convey messages. You can, it, can, it cannot do that. But the property of the other electron is changed. So, it's a very good question. So, and once we understand that, uh, once we understand, we use this quantum mechanics to understand the property of a single atom. We can emerge it, we can use to understand more complicated objects, like the, property, the properties of molecules. And then, we can, Besides molecule, we can combine this, and so we, are, we understand the atom. For example, you learned this in, in high school, that uh, the electron binded by, by a proton has these uh, discrete energy levels. And uh, energy, the energies of the, the electrons can be written by something like that. Once you understand this, you can combine the electrons, you put them together, you put the atoms together, you understand a single atom, and then you put different, you put the atoms together to form a lattice. You can also use quantum mechanics to understand that, right? When you put the atoms together in a in a in a periodic structure, that forms a crystal. So actually, quantum mechanics did not just help us to to understand individual atoms, but also molecules, but also materials like metal, insulator, semiconductors, super, even superconductors. Okay. So it's a very powerful thing. So in the past, 
almost 100 years, our, our understanding, advancement in, in, in the understanding of materials, for example, is purely based on quantum mechanics. So, importantly, we can understand materials, semiconductors like silicon. So, with the understanding of silicon, people can make devices such as transistors, which are the most basic component, the, the basic components of modern circuits, electrical circuits. So this is a, a transistor, so the, the symbol is made from so silicon. Uh, you can, you can uh, call the N-type or P-type silicon. You fabricate them together to form a transistor. So this is because we can do that because our understand because of the help of quantum mechanics. And each each transistor, you can have current go. You can allow it. You can allow the current to pass from here to here. You can say, okay, that's my one state. And you can you can do something here to control. You don't allow current to from to flow from here from the left to the right, and you can call it a zero state. So a transistor. It gives you, it's like a switch, but it gives you, uh, it, it can form a bit, the zero or one state, which is, if in one state you allow current to pass from the left to right, a zero state you don't allow, it, for example. And with the transistor, you can combine to, the, to form the logic gates. From the logic gates, you can form the circuits. For example, in your, in your cell phone right now, uh, I just look at it from Wikipedia. So I think if you have the latest uh, iPhone 11, so at the, the CPU of your iPhone 11 has about, it's very tiny, right? so it has about 8.5 billion transistors in it. 8.5 billion in a single CPU. So that's a really, really amazing. So, and this is a guy, a co-inventor, so Shockley, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's one of the person who uh, invented uh, source station systems. And he got a Nobel Prize for that. And he found his uh, company, uh, Shockley, uh, semiconductor company, in uh, 1956. Uh, near uh, Palo Alto, which is uh, uh, the Silicon Valley, uh, the place uh, where Silicon Valley is. I think the Silicon Valley is the Silicon Valley today. Uh, one of the reasons is because of him. So he went back home to try to take care of the... Uh, 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 that's near, uh, I, sh I should say. But Silicon Valley now is actually near his hometown. So after working with... Uh, at the Bell Lab, he invented a transistor. He decided to go back to his hometown and, and open a company. And, uh, and he hired a whole bunch of very bright young people. Here you see the eight of them. And uh, he got a Nobel Prize, so that's very good. But he apparently he's not very good at running a company. So these young people kind of uh, betrayed him. <laughs> and then they, formed their, they found their own company. That company is called Intel. So, and then also from Intel, some of them left also found AMD. So all these uh, big tech companies, if you look at the history, they can go back to the understanding of quantum mechanics, understand understanding of the properties of semiconductors, the invention of set of uh, transistors, and then using these transistors to make uh, electronic devices. So that's how quantum mechanics in the past almost 100 years really had a huge impact on our world. So, but the transistors, they are getting smaller and smaller. You need to pack more and more transistors together. And, but that creates a problem. As I told you, you in, your, in your phone, you have billions of transistors had in a very small, tiny area, billions, literally. So that causes problems because you need, 
when the when these transistors operate, they generate heat. So you have heating effects, and also you have those uh, because these transistors are so tiny. So electrons actually can incidentally tunnel from when they get when they are too, uh, so small. Electrons can tunnel from one transistor to another. That is called quantum tunneling effect. So nowadays we are really facing this. Uh, we are also we are almost uh, to the limit of how how many transistors that, that we can put into a single piece uh, in a unit area in in a in a, in a single piece of uh, uh, CPU. We are really almost reaching the limit of how many transistors that we can put there. So, but what are the solutions? Well, people are think, thinking about two. One is, okay, how about we I, I try to find new materials which are more energy efficient, you need less heat, so that maybe I can uh, bypass this heating effect. And, uh, but it's still difficult to bypass this tunneling effect, okay? But maybe you can do, you have some, have some levels of improvement. But another is that, well, you can have, you can try new ways of doing computation. That's what I'm trying to talk about. So that's another, the new way is quantum computation. How quantum mechanics can help you. <clears throat> so even though, I want to emphasize, even though the transistors you make is because you know how to make them because of quantum mechanics. But when you are actually doing the calculations, you are not using the principles of some key principles of quantum mechanics to do the calculation. Okay, so which I will, I will explain. So now, just imagine that if we can use the principles of quantum mechanics to do calculations, what can we do? So let's look at a, a quantum bit, just suppose we can make that. Just like the electron that we have, our old friend. So this electron. This electron, as I mentioned before, because of the principle of superposition, this electron can be at spin up and spin down state at the same time. Okay? So it can be at the spin up and spin down state at the same time. So that means that a quantum qubit can represent both up and down at the same time. Okay, that's fine. If I give you a classical object, a classical magnet, the spin up or spin down of that magnet, okay, well, that gives me one of the states. Or the opening or shutting of the transistor, that gives me one or zero state. So now, if you give me a quantum object, a quantum bit, okay, you tell me that, well, I can be in two states at the same time. Well, that's great. I, I just, I just you, I can just use two transistors to represent that two states. Okay, maybe, maybe fine. One, you have, you gave me one electron. Okay, not a big deal. But you realize that when you have two electrons, two electrons can represent four states at the same time because both electrons can be up or both of them the spin can be down, or one of them is up, the other is down, and one of them is down, the other is up. So, if you give me two electrons, it represents two states at the same time. If you give me 10 electrons, or this 10 qubits, that 10 qubits can represent two to power 10 of states at the same time. That's a loss of states. That's about probably a million states. That's a loss of state. So, whereas for a classical, for a classical, um, if you give me 10 classical bits, at any given time, that 10 bits can only be one of the two to power 10 states. But for a quantum, for 10 quantum bits, it can represent 2 to the power 10 states at the same time, all the states at the same time, at least in principle. So if you give me 50 qubits, 
50 qubits. That 50 qubits can represent 2 to the power 50 states at the same time. How large is that? This is this is billion trillion, a thousand trillion states at the same time. A thousand trillion states at the same time. You just gave me 50 qubits. So that's a lot of states. And uh, classical computers cannot handle this. OK. So and more importantly, if I have a classical com computer, a classical processor, I put a classical state into it, into a classical processor, the output is, well, I have 50 bits. All these one and zero states, you put into your processor, you get maybe some different combination of one and zero, but you one state in, one state out. Okay? And in the process, your processor changed one state. However, if I have a quantum bit, so this I put this 50 bits into my quantum processor, and this quantum bit because it's a linear combination of 2 to the power 50 states, I just work on this one state, and actually at the same time, I'm working on my, process, my quantum processor is able to act on all these 2 to the power 50 states at the same time. Wow, so it sounds really, really uh, powerful. And this is called quantum parallelism. And you ask, well, oh, this is just a, a picture. OK, you want to go through this maze, OK? And you start from here. Classically, you just try a different path, one by one, and see, well, how can I go out from this maze? But quantum mechanically, when the particle comes in, it will, it will at the same time, explore all the possible paths, all of them, at the same time. Okay, so that is the power of quantum mechanics. And uh, it turns out that, well, if you can really make these qubits, and they can help you to do quantum computation, and then they are actually powerful, uh, they can help you to do some things which can do better, than, they can do certain tasks better than classical computers. For example, factorizing very large numbers and uh, for random data searching. Now, this is quite amazing. Uh, well, uh, well, if you have more detailed questions, I can, I can answer them later. But this is quite amazing. For example, if, have a, if you have, in your database, you have one million objects unsorted, you don't know the sequence of them. You find you want to find out one object out of one million uh, randomly random allocated. Uh, uh, so you, you want to you want you want to find one one data out of one million uh, one million data in your database. Classically you have to search almost one million times in order for you to get that data out. But a classical computer allows you to just do it 1,000 times. So this is a, what is what I was talking about. This is data searching. So if you can make a quantum computer, you can do that for you. And uh, also, as you mentioned, some, uh, actually a lot of uh, quantum mechanical processes are very important, and we don't fully understand them. And quantum systems, particularly those, involve electrons, which they interact with each other. Those problems are particularly hard. And there are many of those problems, such as uh, uh, you know, if you want to try to understand the chemical reaction between molecules, if you try to understand some materials, like high temperature superconductors, these involve very complicated quantum systems. And, uh, and, and it's hard to understand, but a quantum computer can help, can help us to simulate
those systems and understand them. One of the interesting questions is, for example, if you want to make some fertilizer out of, you know, in the air that we, we, we are breathing in, there's a lot, a lot of nitrogen. And you want to combine nitrogen with hydrogen so that you, you can form ammonia or other nitrogen-based uh, fertilizer. And so people can do that. Nowadays, you have industrial processes to do that. But that requires high temperature, high pressure. It takes a lot of energy, actually. Nowadays, we, we, because of the, the farming industry, we actually need a lot of fertilizer. And 1 or 2% of the total, the world's total energy consumption actually goes to making fertilizers like that. But apparently, we are not making it very efficiently. Because bacteria, they don't need high temperature and high pressure to, to do the same thing. They can do it in a much more energy efficient way. So industrial, so, but the industry cannot do that because we don't really understand even a seemingly very simple process like this, combine nitrogen and, and hydrogen into ammonia. We don't even under, fully understand processes like that. So, if you have, because this is, these are quantum processes that are so, so uh, easy to figure out. So, if we have a quantum computer, that can help us to understand different uh, chemical processes, and maybe we can find energy efficient ways of, say, making fertilizers. <coughs> and we can also, as I mentioned, help us to understand complicated materials, such as hydrogen superconductors. So, it's, well, I talk about, the, for example, this uh, quantum powder something. If you have that, well, it can help us to you know, do some calculations much faster than classical computers. But why are we not using quantum computers nowadays? We understand the principles already. So, the problem is that quantum states are fragile. So, for example, uh, we have this qubit, this state. As I mentioned before, it can be a linear combination. It is superposition or superposition of millions and millions of states. And you want to put the state into your processor, and then you try to start manipulating it. So, but the problem is that not just your processor, but the environment is also affecting this quantum state. Your environment can change how, how this uh, superposition, different states, for example, the weighting of different states can be changed by the environment. So that means that the, it's very, the, the, the difficulty is that these quantum states are too fragile. Is, uh, your environment can easily destroy it, and then you put it in your quantum processor, even in the process of manip to manipulating it, the environment is also working on it. So, and, uh, so, and your environment will, will destroy all the useful information you want to get. So this is a, a major, major challenge, which is due to the fact that the quantum states are too fragile. You need to protect them. And then, the other is that the other difficulty is you have you can create many many different qubits, but this, these different qubits you need them to talk to each other in the language that I used previously. You need them to be entangled to each other, so to fully use the this, the power of of uh, of quantum mechanics. You need you need to make the qubits individual qubits, very good ones. But at the same time, you need them to talk to each other. And that is actually very difficult. So, and the question is, can we build quantum computers, really, because of these two major challenges? And you can. Uh, you can build, and people are building them. So, but the, the question is, how could a quantum computer that can be built? And, uh, <coughs> so, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are some companies like Google. They are building quantum computers. And uh, for example, this uh, 
Google's uh, quantum artificial intelligence lab, and uh, led by a physicist. Uh, and this is the machine. And this is the, the chip, the quantum computing chip that uh, they made. So the material itself is not very fancy, actually. The black one is a, just a piece of sapphire. Okay, it, it serves as a as a platform. Or you can think it's like a piece of glass. And then you put you you deposit aluminum. It's not very fancy, aluminum. You aluminum that we have every day for uh, for 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 when you drink a soda can. And so the can is made from aluminum. So, but you, you, you need to deposit aluminum on top of a piece of glass and make this cross structure, and then you attach some control to it. And what an what, what, uh, interesting property of aluminum is that actually they can be superconducting at very low temperature, not at room temperature, okay? They are superconducting at around one Kelvin, very low temperature. So, but once they are superconducting, so this cross is represented by the cross here. And an electron, an electron can jump into or out of this cross. Okay, an electron can jump into or out of this cross. So, but quantum mechanics tells you the electron can be, can be on the cross and it can be out of the cross at the same time. If the electron is on the cross, you can say, okay, that's my one state. When the electron is not there, you can say, oh, that's my zero state. So you have this, uh, that one and zero in the presence or absence of the electron, that gives you a quantum qubit, okay? And then you can couple, put that nine qubits together for this quantum computing chip. And actually, you can use that to do some calculations, like simulate. So you can use each cross to spin a stimulated spin, and then you use, you can simulate how spin, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine spins, they interact with each other. You can use nine cross to simulate quantum spin system, okay. Or you can use that to calculate some energy level of some molecules, like that. So you can really use that to do some simple calculations. And actually, there are also companies, they, sell, they, they started selling quantum computers. So uh, one of these is a so-called D-Wave system, a Canadian uh, company. So, and uh, they sell quantum computers like selling iPhones. They have their uh, first generation D Wave 1 quantum computer with a 128 qubits. Okay. And then they're making, they're making more and more. They, they, they put more and more qubits uh, into their chip. And uh, by year 2013, they have this uh, 516 qubits in, in the quantum computing chip. And uh, by year 2017, they will make already put 2,000 chips there, qubits there. So and this is uh, the machine that's called D-Wave. And uh, so you see all this, this big machine, well, mostly this big box is just to shield the year wave from the environment. You remember, quantum, quantum uh, states are very fragile. You need to shield them from the environment. And then these big pieces, well, part of it is to control your qubits. But another part, the most, the one of the most important parts is actually to put it down to a very low temperature. Actually, your quantum computing chip itself is actually very tiny. It's actually very tiny. And this is a, this is a, a D wave chip. On this chip, you have a, you pack you pack many of them together. Each each of them, you have uh, seven qubits. But as I talk about, 
So it doesn't mean that D-Wave really makes very powerful computers because you can create many, many qubits. But as I mentioned, in order to, to fully use or utilize the power of quantum mechanics, you really need to make sure that the qubits themselves are talking to each other or they are entangled to each other. But this is very hard to do. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not believed that the qubits in the, made by the company are fully entangled. Okay, and then it is, it is a problem. And who are buying them? There are lots of companies buying them. So if you, if you know who they are. So this is uh, uh, Lockheed Martin doing a lot of making lots of weapons, unfortunately. And you have uh, Google and NASA, you have this uh, Los Alamos National Lab, they buy quantum computers from this D-Wave company. This is, a, this is a laboratory which made the first uh, atomic bomb in the world. And uh, you also have uh, Volkswagen, you know, the car company, probably trying to use a quantum computer to solve some optimization problems. So, and uh, you can ask, okay, how much are they cost? Each of them costs 50 million US dollars, okay, from, from the D-Wave company. So IBM is also making uh, computers. And uh, Intel, as I mentioned, also making one computers. And uh, so what are the remaining challenges? Oh, people are doing that. So what are the remaining challenges? The main challenge is the qubit coherence time is very short. Okay, uh, maybe in the hundreds, in hundreds of nanoseconds. So very quickly, because of the effect of the environment, the effect of the environment can quickly destroy the information you have for your qubit. Okay, that time is very short. It's a, it's in the in the orders of, in the order of hundreds of nanoseconds, a very short time, and then the information is gone. So, and you need to. That means that you need to do operations within that very short period of time in order for you to do some meaningful calculations. And also, it's very hard to 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 put to entangle the students together. So you hear a lot of this. Uh, uh, you, you, you maybe you, you, you are hearing a lot of the news about you know, nowadays a lot of news. Oh, uh, IBM is making this 20 qubit quantum computer. Oh, Intel is making this a 50 qubit. Google is making this a 70 qubit. You heard a lot of uh, words like that. What does it really mean? In principle, if you have a fully entangled uh, 50 qubits quantum computer, if this 50 qubits they are fully entangled and you can make use of them. This is already, already very powerful because as we talked about previously, if you have 50 qubits, this 50 qubits can represent two to power 50 states at the same time. This is already the limit of any classical computers that can handle. It's beyond the, any classical computers uh, can handle. So these companies, they are trying to build computers, quantum computers, which are more powerful than classical computers. So, and, uh, well, they are trying, but uh, it's, it's, it's not so sure that how successful they are at this point. I mean, in doing meaningful uh, calculations. And there's another company, which I did not mention, which is Microsoft. Microsoft, have also, they have a different plan of uh, making qubits. Instead of using electrons or pairs of electrons, like so-called copper pairs, so they use a different particles called Majorana fermion. So it's just that you can think of each Majorana is a one half of a, of a fermion or one half of an electron. Not, not completely, but but you can, you can imagine that. So you can put this two uh, Majorana fermion together, and then another Majorana, two Majoranas together. These two Majorana, they can form a state, and that state can be occupied or empty. So 
marijuana can fall into it. And if you, you have a, a many, many pairs of marijuana, that gives you many pairs of tulips. And you can entangle them by moving this marijuana formulas around. So, <clears throat> and then what you get is the quantum state, which is fully entangled. So, and this is a very interesting scheme. Actually, this is the marijuana particles. These are the, this is a subject that I studied uh, in, the, in the past uh, decade. So, you can find these marijuana particles, for example, if you have an endo wire, you put a superconductor next to it, and also you need to apply magnetic field. But in any case, you can find uh, these marijuana formulas in some special types of superconductors. And this gentleman here, uh, Neil Calvin Hogan, Calvin Hogan, he visited us a few times in Hong Kong here. And uh, this gentleman uh, is, is one of the leading instrumentalists uh, for Microsoft uh, for searching marijuana formulas. And uh, I'm a theorist, so my job is to predict if you have a marijuana formula, what you will see. How can you tell? You do some experiments. How can you tell if the marijuana formula is there or not? So <clears throat> many years ago, so we had some theoretical prediction. We tell the experimentalists that, oh, OK, if you have a marijuana here, and then you try to inject some, some electrons from your lead to through the marijuana to the superconductor. Oh, you will see some peak in the middle, like that. So we predicted something like that. And it was actually later verified by the, by the Dell's group. So for example, we predicted experimentally you should have some peak in the signature when you do the experiment. And that peak, we predicted how high that peak is in the unit of 2e squared over h to quantize that precise that value if you have marijuana on your so we predicted that in the theoretical paper that is back in uh, uh, 2009, 2009. And actually, that prediction was verified uh, recently, uh, last year, uh, by Calvin Holden's group, by, by this gentleman's experimental group. So, <coughs> so, uh, uh, so here is the summary. So you see that many big companies, uh, they, are, they are doing it. So at the beginning, I talk about many of the big companies, like AT&T, like uh, uh, General Electric, like uh, uh, IBM. So you see that these are the big technological companies of their time, 100 years ago. So they still are today. So if you have the technology, uh, and then you can you can make useful things, uh, and you can increase productivity. You can you can help people, or you can create job opportunities. Right. So that's why when people realize that oh, you have this the prospect of quantum computation, maybe you can make much much faster computers than classical computers. And you can use this quantum computer to understand chemical processes. It can help you to, to have a better understanding of drugs. It helps you to have a better understanding of materials like hydrogen superconductors. So, and when you have uh, big potential applications like that, so these big companies, and they want to study, they want to invest in it, and they want to see how they can make use of it. And they want to be the, the leaders in that area. So that's why quantum computers are being built uh, all over the world right now. Alibaba also, you know, uh, Tencent also has recently. These are uh, also Chinese big uh, technological companies. They are also interested in this uh, uh, quantum computation. So, these quantum computers are being built around the world. And uh, that's why we are here today, that we want to, 
we need to prepare our young people for the opportunities and the challenges to come. But at least, you know what, what is there in that field? What is really happening? What is called computation? How we can use them? And maybe one day, okay, if you learn quantum mechanics well enough, you can find a job there. Okay, in this direction. Thank you very much.